Welcome everyone to uh, our webinar series on building capacity for resilience-based management. We're thrilled that you are joining us. Um, this series is delivered by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation's Resilient Reefs Initiative in partnership with um, our partner, the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network. Um, uh, my name is Amy Armstrong. I'm the Director of Resilient Reefs, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the initiative and the webinar series, and then turn it over to um, our speaker for today. The Resilient Reefs Initiative is um, a global effort to support coral reefs and the communities that depend on them to adapt to climate change um, and other local pressures. We're currently working with five World Heritage listed sites um, around the world, bringing together local partners and global resilience experts um, to identify new solutions um, to building the resilience. We provide a variety of support to sites, including uh, creation and funding for a new leadership role, a chief resilience officer. Um, there's a couple chief resilience officers on the webinar today. Um, we provide technical support and capacity building in the development of a holistic resilience strategy that looks at threats to both the community and uh, ecosystem. We have an amazing uh, set of partners and a global knowledge network and connect um, our reef sites to those experts. Um, and we very importantly have um, five million dollars set aside to support our sites and implementation. So as soon as those holistic resilience strategies are done, um, we move um, into implementation and, and partner on on-ground action. We're piloting this work in five UNESCO sites, uh, the Great Barrier Reef and Ningaloo Coast, um, both in Australia, the lagoons of New Caledonia, um, Belize's uh, Mesoamerican Reef, and the Rock Island Southern Lagoon in Palau. Our effort really is about leveraging global partnerships for local impact. Um, and so we have an amazing array of partners that you'll see on the slide. Um, the program is uh, funded by the BHP Foundation and delivered in partnership with UNESCO, the Nature Conservancy, um, Columbia University Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes, Resilient Cities Catalyst, and AECOM. The webinar series came out of a desire from our five reef sites um, to be in better contact, um, to share best practices, um, to ask each other questions, um, and to, to leverage the network's expertise. Um, we are putting together a series of topics that we think help support um, CROs understand and build resilience-based management, um, and so it has taken a variety of, of different um, angles. Um, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to um, our guest speaker for today. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer O'Leary. I am a Marine Program Coordinator with the Wildlife Conservation Society in the Western Indian Ocean. And I am also one of the coordinators of a network that I helped co-create called the Smart Seas Network. And today I'd like to take the opportunity to, to talk to you a little bit about this network that has been established over the last 10 years and the approach uh, to improving MPAs that has been developed through the network called the Strategic Adaptive Management um, Approach, or SAM. And um, I'm gonna hopefully take you on a little bit of, of, of a journey as to, to why we started doing this work in the Western Indian Ocean and, and sort of where we've, we've gotten to with it and some lessons learned along the way in trying to help create effective marine protected areas or MPAs. So I want to start with some really basic information that you all probably know, which is that this is an ocean planet. Um, of the massive amount of space on the ocean that has MPAs, um, uh, right now the estimates are hovering around 6 to sometimes 7 percent of the ocean with um, currently having marine protected areas. Fully protected marine reserves are still very, very low at 2.5 um, percent. And the targets for MPAs around the world are to have at least 10%, and some scientists um, are now arguing for 30% by 2030, so really increasing the coverage of marine protected areas around the globe, and this is incredibly important. But at the same time, there are some challenges. Um, so according to, to literature, only about 30% of MPAs globally have actually demonstrated management effectiveness. To just give you an example of what this might mean, there was a study done in 2010 of, um, of a lot of protected areas in Australia, um, essentially hundreds, and, and found that actually 90% of the protected areas, and these are, are terrestrial and marine, actually didn't have effectiveness assessments that included data. 
And so when you're assessing how well an MP is doing and you don't really have data to, to back that up, it's sort of the equivalent of patting yourself on the shoulder and saying you're doing a good job, but not having the metrics to actually assess that. And this is very, very common around the world. And so one question we might ask ourselves is, are we really managing these MPs that we're creating effectively for the ecological and societal benefits that we're promising people when we close off an area and set it aside as a marine protected area? And the reason this has become very important to me is that this um, picture represents one of the MPAs in the Western Indian Ocean, but this is also an MPA in, in the Western Indian Ocean. And so just um, putting aside an area on the map may not be enough to create um, an effective and functional MPA. So what is this uh, elusive idea of management effectiveness? Um, so there's a great guidebook developed by IUCN um, on um, management effectiveness. And one of the key things is how well does your MPA meet objectives? Now, many MPAs don't have clear objectives and that's sort of part of the challenge, um, but the general process is that you should have objectives. Ideally, these objectives would be smart, so they'd be specific, measurable, ambitious, realistic, and, and time-bound. So they'd have a target and a deadline. When you have those objectives, you go out, you collect information about the system, and you ask yourself, how, how is the MPA doing? And then figure out um, for those objectives that are not met, what's, what actions are needed to really um, move that MPA forward. And so it's trying to move from a reactive to a proactive process. And so this should be very simple, but actually there's a lot of complexity. So in this guide, um, uh, how is your MPA doing? There's a really complex chart that I have on the screen showing all the steps that would need to happen to, to do this really, really well and with a strong scientific backing. And there's a couple challenges to this. So there's a lot of steps. And all the while this is happening, you're, you're still asking managers to maintain MPA performance. So this, this is a pretty high task load. The other thing is a lot of these steps, all the ones that I've circled, actually require a significant amount of, of scientific support. And so there are some challenges in getting MPAs towards this, uh, this idea of effectiveness. And so one of the challenges is the lack of scientific support. And there is this known science to management gap. And this extends, of course, beyond marine protected areas. There's a lot of information on this. And, and we know that often published literature, you know, conservation assessments fail to lead to management action. And it's often not that the information doesn't exist. So there's often a lot of information about these systems. And that's certainly true of the Western Indian Ocean. So there are some other barriers are, that are in place. Um, you know, on, on the side of managers, sometimes, not always, they have lack of access to literature or databases. They may also have low capacity to understand literature and low amounts of time that they can invest in reading literature and identifying the appropriate documents and pulling out that information that's really going to be helpful to them in making management decisions. So it's not distilled in a way that's useful for them immediately. There is also, on behalf of scientists, a mismatch often between research and management needs. And so um, it's really important that, that we start looking at this and try to align those more. And then again, sometimes the data is reported in, in ways that are difficult for managers to use, like scientific publications, which is often the, the objective of scientific work is to kind of create that publication. But the interesting thing is that even when research is provided to managers, there's often a, still a failure um, to uptake that into management action. And so sometimes it's that there's a lack of a simple and clear management framework through which um, the, the information coming in can be incorporated into decision making. Um, and so the adaptive management process does actually, in a, a simplified version of this, provide a pathway to that. Um, so adaptive management essentially involves objective setting. The objectives are really, really important. Um, so that's sort of how you know where you're going. Once you have those objectives, you're going to go out and you're going to do some monitoring or collect some information about the system and ask yourself, you know, how are, are we doing um, on meeting those objectives? When you've identified objectives that are, are not doing as well, you can implement actions that are really targeted at getting to those objectives. And when you take those actions, they're, they're an experiment. You may not know if that's the right action, but you, you try something and then you have to go back in and assess, did that really work? And through doing that assessment, you have a great opportunity to learn about the system. And this learning is what really promotes the adaptation that we're looking for in these systems and allowing them to rapidly respond to change. And then over time, you can sort of refine your objectives. And as, as you move through this process, 
and get more and more information, your understanding of the system gets bigger and bigger, and you can do a better and better job of managing the, the, the MPA or the resources. Um, so this is an approach that helps to move towards um, proactively addressing challenges. And, and again, this is an image from how is your MPA doing? So the idea is, are is your MPA looking like the bus on the left or the bus on the right? And when I've asked this question of what does your MPA look like to dozens of MPA managers, they all point to the bus on the left. So even though we have this process in mind and there are guidebooks and tools about how to, how to achieve this, it doesn't seem to be easily implemented into marine protected areas. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I just want to really emphasize those objectives, because if you don't have objectives, you really don't know where you're trying to go. And in reviewing dozens of MPA management plans, um, one thing that is, is often there is that there are very, very long lists of, of objectives that don't have targets associated with them. So it's essentially a wish list with, you know, sometimes 20 or 30 different things that the MPA is supposed to achieve, but without giving guidance of what is it going to look like when you actually get there. So, so one of the really important steps is spending some time to, um, to really describe what is the destination we're trying to get to so that you can then lay out a pathway of how you're going to get there. Um, and so I started this process uh, with um, colleagues from a number of management institutions and other scientists uh, 10 years ago in 2009. And for 10 years, we've been um, working with uh, different groups of MPAs. Um, and as I said, we've kind of co-developed this approach called Strategic Adaptive Management, or SAM, and then a network that supports that called the Smart Seas um, Africa Network. Um, SMART, of course, stands for the way we'd like our objectives to be. And essentially, what we've been trying to do is to mentor MPAs in using science to achieve management effectiveness and helping them build the skills and tools to, to do that and finding ways to really integrate that approach into management agencies. And so just to give you an idea of sort of what this approach looks like for us is, first of all, we work with government MPA management institutions. Um, that was an explicit choice because we felt that if we can strengthen the, the institutions that are responsible for managing the resources, they will be a great source of outreach and support for the communities and, and helping communities that are then launching into their own locally managed marine areas, which is also incredibly important. So as we move through this process of trying to achieve adaptive management, we partner really strongly with communities and try to build an institutional culture focused on co-management and engagement of communities in all the aspects of MPA management and decision making. One of the really key aspects that we've developed through this, this network and the SAM approach is, is to train entire agencies. And this is kind of novel because in a lot of trainings, what you'll see is that a couple people from an institution, so if you see this little pyramid of people as an institution, are taken to a training. So maybe a blue guy and a green guy. And those people get some great skills and tools and they come back with the idea that those people are then gonna, gonna institute some changes in their institution, but the institution itself isn't flexible it's really hard for those individuals to create the change that's needed within the institution. And in fact, institutions really are these interconnected networks of people. So we decided that it's really important that we train everybody. And this goes from, from the very high level managers and directors all the way down to the, you know, the office staff and even you know, janitorial staff to really create a team behind this. And then we developed some elements um, that we thought would really help these marine protected areas, so a toolkit focused on objectives and monitoring and, and planning management actions and reporting. And probably the most important thing that has emerged from this is the need to really create a culture where innovation is valued and people have a chance to lead. Um, and one lesson learned from this is that, the, that in, in implementing these tools and creating this shift towards adaptive management, it, it is not a quick process. So it's a very long-term process that, that can take you know, five to 10 years of support to really um, you know, help an institution move through that. And the support can be internal or external, but it is a long mentoring process. Um, and increasingly, as we've had more, um, more MPAs join this network, we've really been focusing on how can we have, um, so how can we have peer support for the network and for the approaches. And so we've done, we have a Facebook group with about 500 MPA uh, staff members from all 10 countries of the Western Indian Ocean. And we recently did a, a peer training event where we were really trying to build the skills of peer trainers to help uh, support the approaches in their own institutions. 
So when I, with colleagues, started um, this journey uh, towards, uh, you know, of, of helping MPAs work towards management effectiveness, you know, we, we worked um, in different marine protected areas and found some different challenges along the way. So in, in some of the MPAs, we found that understanding of the MPA system was very, very low to begin with. So, so many staff could not explain sort of the purpose of the MPA. Uh, you know, there were often staff who did not understand that corals were living, living animals. Often not a lot of staff had swimming skills, so hadn't really interacted with these resources, which makes it very, very challenging to actually get into active management. In other MPAs, there were other, you know, different things that we observed, which is that there was, we're often lacking staff understanding of what a good MPA should really look like. So we found that some staff didn't know, often up to 50%. Um, this, the staff were really scattered in their responses, so there was no dominant response coming out of any individual MPA. And there was less focus on actually the MPA outcomes that, that a lot of people might think were really critical. So not a lot of focus on improved ecosystems or societal benefits and, and a lot more focus on sort of the steps to get there, uh, like enforcement or having good facilities and revenue. And so lack of sort of a holistic picture of what management effectiveness might be. And so when we started working on this, we had this sort of idealized adaptive management, you know, steps that I've already talked about. So setting objectives as the first core thing and then, you know, monitoring and data access and planning actions and moving towards adaptation and resilience. But through the process of working with these MPAs, we realized that there were a few things that were actually not on this list that are really, really critical. And that from the starting point of many of the MPAs in this system, they were not ready to set objectives and that we really first had to work on interest and passion for the marine system and, and understanding of MPAs, um, getting, getting that leadership behind this change. There was a lot of skill building that needed to happen and that staff really needed to learn about the ecological and social system before they'd be ready to do objectives. And the other thing that we learned is that monitoring in this particular system was kind of the carrot that all of the staff across three different countries were really interested in as a tool to promote their learning. And so monitoring was sort of the entry point, that that was what they got passionate about. And then once they started to engage in monitoring, then they became much more interested in the other elements of the process and, and got to the point that they were ready to, to set the objectives and start working through MPA management. And so, you know, with the, the parks, uh, you know, we went through, um, once the team sort of were ready and had the skills and, and were excited to do this, we went through a process of objective setting. This is an example list of initial objectives, and there are actually some challenges with this list that I'm going to talk about later because these are a lot of objectives. And I'm not going to read through this, but what I do want you to see is that they, they really, um, in this particular case, they, they sort of looked at different elements of MPA management, ecological status, threats, and as well as human aspects. And then each objective, and this is really important, actually has a numeric target. So if your focus is on improving coral cover, you now know what you'd want your monitoring to show about the coral cover in a successful MPA. So if you're not finding that, then you can take appropriate management actions to work over, you know, over appropriate time, time periods to understand what is the threat and how you're going to address it. Um, and by setting objectives, one of the benefits that we saw is that these MPAs became much more focused. And so this is an example from one marine protected area where they actually painted an entire wall of a building. And I apologize for the quality of this photo. It actually came from an MPA staff member from their cell phone. And the wall of this building was painted as the science for active management wall. And on the left, kind of outside of the picture, they actually listed their management objectives. In the center panel with the table, they're sort of reporting out on what is their most recent data about one of their objectives around coral cover. And then in the panel of the, on, the, on the right, they're actually showing that graphically. And the horizontal line is, is at their target of 25%. And so they're now able to explain to visitors which sites in their park are, are at their target and which sites are, are below the target. And, and they can explain how they're focusing their management actions to improve the sites that are lower than the, the target. This is a massive change in, in this MPA system from a staff that couldn't really talk knowledgeably about what was in the MPA, couldn't list the species, didn't understand what was going on, to having a very thoughtful approach to what, what they're doing and being able to communicate that to people. 
Um, and so we've, we've been working on this approach, as I've mentioned now, in, in three countries. We actually started the approach in Kenya. Uh, Tanzania was next to join, and the most recent uh, MPA system to join is, is in the Seychelles. And by working through this process of building passion and setting objectives and, and coming up with a monitoring approach, they actually now, through this, the, the SAM approach, do monthly monitoring. They go out every single month and assess these resources. We've had some great successes in conservation action and really people seeing that they're not meeting the objectives in some cases and their data is showing that. And so they go out and take action that actually creates change. So I'm going to give a couple examples of this. Um, one example um, is uh, on bleaching, where um, because they're using permanent transects, they really get to know their sites and they were, are able to see when corals start bleach because they're out there every single month and actually and sometimes are the first group to be able to notify others of bleaching events that are happening. There have been also been cases, as in the pictures that I've shown, where they've actually been able to see recovery of, of corals. So this is the same coral on the top and the, the, the bottom over on the left. And, oh, sorry. Um, and, um, and so they've been able to share these findings of some reef resilience, and that was very exciting. So MPA managers now becoming the experts on the system. There's been a lot of efforts on invasive species removal and kilometers of sea turtle habitat has been open, opened up by removing um, invasive plants like cactus and sisal. One of the most exciting uh, successes has been on seagrass recovery. So one of the MPAs, um, which had a closed zone called the park, and a sustainably fish zone called the reserve started uh, noticing from their seagrass data that they were collecting every month that the reserve had very, very low seagrass density. And so that prompted this MPA to have some discussions on why that would be and opened up discussions about the fact that even though beach seining, which essentially drags nets over the bottom of the ocean to take out fish, was illegal, that it really hadn't been enforced. And so this MPA decided to really work with the, the community and to, to really um, enforce that regulation. And over a period of 18 months, they actually were able to see a complete recovery of seagrass over 200 square kilometers, um, which has massive benefits. And the fishermen that were using sustainable gears started reporting higher fish catches. So it was a, a great win for that MPA. There's also been a lot of emphasis on clean beaches. So having, uh, you know, having huge integration of stakeholders and actually picking up all this plastic trash, which is generated from beach users and also brought in on ocean currents. And some of the MPs have reported that because of their efforts to keep the beaches clean, they've actually seen increases in domestic tourism. And some communities have been linked to new revenue through recycling. And so these are some really, really big successes. Um, and because this talk is kind of about lessons learned, um, I also want to just, you know, review sort of what are some of the more um, programmatic and, and approach driven successes and some of the persistent challenges so that this might be useful to others. So in terms of successes, I think, you know, we've really had a lot of focus on improving the knowledge and understanding and there's been a huge generation of new skills. Monthly monitoring has been incredibly important. So initially, it was the MPA staff themselves that said they wanted to monitor monthly. And as a scientist, I wasn't sure that that made sense. I didn't think these ecosystems would change that fast. But what I've learned from them is that this was important within the institutional system so that they had a schedule and they were doing this frequently enough and that it really created sort of eyes on the MPA and helped them to, um, to know what's happening at their park all the time. Um, through this, I've also learned that, that for them, often it's not necessarily the data that drives management action, it's actually what they see. And so seeing, they always tell me seeing is believing. And so this eyes on the MPA approach is sort of a, a very active way that they can understand the MPA, even if they don't quite have the skills to use the data. Um, and through this, uh, this monitoring and sort of focus on what are we really trying to achieve, there's been a really strong sense of new mental models. So, so MPA staff sort of had an initial conception often of seeing themselves as soldiers out enforcing, and they've really shifted towards seeing themselves as conservationists and problem solvers. And then, as I just said, there have been some improved conservation outcomes. There are also persistent challenges. So there are institutional challenges in terms of staff uh, transfer and turnover, lack of finances, and there are still challenges in, in often high level incorporation of these principles. MPA staff uh, skills still need building, and so there are still challenges around species I I identification. There are challenges around um, being able to do uh, data manipulation and graphing, and so there's still a lot of skill building that's needed. 
And there's not always follow through on the adaptive cycle. And so though they have objectives and they have um, information through their monthly monitoring and have observations of the system, they don't always reflect back and actually connect the dots to plan their management action. So it happens, but not all the time. Um, and so there's still sort of additional building to do with these, these, these institutions and creating sort of institutional leadership to support this approach. There is still inadequate connectivity with researchers. And so we've gone through a number of attempts of, of uh, asking researchers in many different ways to contribute their data into the system. And that still remains a big challenge. And then of course, there's increasing pressures to these systems with things like climate change. Um, and so the bigger picture lessons that, that you know, I think we've jointly learned through this process is first of all, we, what we really went through, so I came in as a scientist thinking about this very scientifically and okay, we need to link science to management and have data and, and help you know, use that data. And really what, what this was, was leading a process of behavior change. So there's a lot of papers on how to create environmental behavior change and you know, they're grouped in sort of energy level ownership and empowerment variables. And a lot of trainings, you know, focus on elements of, uh, of environmental behavior. So like ecological knowledge and understanding issues and skills. But if those are the only focus uh, points, one of the things that I've, I've learned with my colleagues is that you're missing an awful lot. And so you're actually not transforming individuals or institutions in changing behavior if that is the only focus. Because what's missing are focusing on attitudes, What's the best learning approach? Can you create a personal investment and a commitment? And are there sort of reinforcement procedures within the institution or the group and an intention to act both as an individual and an institution? And so, you know, in terms of the what captured interest in, in this system, monitoring was key. That was the thing that all the staff really wanted to do. And it really got people excited about the system. And so that was huge in the system. It may be different in other systems. Um, in terms of this investment and creating this, this commitment to new behaviors and this transformation of soldiers to conservationists, I think a couple things that really helped were having an inclusive approach where everybody participated as a group was really important. And because we couldn't give monetary awards and there weren't always institutional rewards that could be given, we created some social awards through a simple thing like a certificate that we called the MPA Champion Award. And once we started issuing this award, people really wanted it and they wanted that recognition. And so as we created this value for being a conservationist, people really wanted to be recognized for that. And that was very powerful. And so these are sort of bottom up approaches to, to, to supporting a process of behavior change. But we also found that it's very, very important to have some reinforcement procedures. And this is really a top-down um, thing where you, you really have to have leadership within the institution and a, and a value for this process and, and for the new behaviors that you're trying to lead. And that if you don't have that, it, there's going to be some long-term challenges. And this process is so still continuing on this, this first point of behavior change. takes a long time, and there's different stages that you go through. So the red stages, there's a lot of fear and resentment. You kind of get through these, these stages of discomfort and then a little bit excited and getting to the green actually takes a while. So it's not going to be quick. And it does also involve a new model of leadership. And so sometimes institutions are very, very hierarchical and that's fine. But within the process of adaptive management, it's really helpful if you can create teams where the leader is really part of the team and everybody has a chance to contribute and to, to have their ideas valued. Um, in terms of sort of trying to improve science to action, um, I do just want to make the point that even though this has been really challenging and, and researchers aren't always uh, quick to give their, their data to the MPAs, there are things that MPAs can do to take control of the research agenda. So first of all, having a list of management questions about the MPA and having that list ready is really important. So when you have this list of things you need to know about your MPA, and you can hand that list to students and researchers who come to ask to work in the MPA. And maybe that's not the focus of their research, but they can take on one element of that. And in my personal story, I was a faculty member at a university. And as a new faculty member, I was sort of looking for how did I want to design my research program at that university? And I talked to a lot of different community groups. And one NGO that was not a science-driven NGO actually had a list of, of questions that they handed to me. Those questions were so important and they raised such important issues about local ecosystems that those questions drove my research agenda for the next four years. And I brought in several other colleagues from the broader uh, university to also focus on those questions and we were able to make a pretty big impact. 
Um, it's really important to, to build a network of researchers to engage with. So this is not a one-off phone call or a one-off meeting. So you have to keep checking in with them. And it's really important for managers to know that if you want researchers to, to work with you and to have an influence on what the research agenda is, that you have to be proactive in creating that network. So you might meet with somebody and you have to keep checking in with them periodically and keep re-meeting with them. And another simple thing that, that can help is just to ask researchers who visit the park to do a presentation on themes of interest to MPA staff. And by doing that, they sort of get to know the MPA staff and MPA staff have an opportunity for learning. So that's the, the second big lesson learned. A third really huge lesson learned, and this was a big piece of learning for me, um, is that objectives are really important but it's really easy to create too many. So I showed you before a list of about 11 objectives that we came up with in a joint process with, with uh, an entire institution. And we really found that, that, you know, it's sort of like this pile of donuts. So while one donut might be really tasty, a dozen donuts might make you feel a little bit sick. And so having too many objectives essentially puts you in the wish list category and it becomes really hard to focus in on areas within a one to, one to two year period where you're gonna make progress. So it's really important, you can have a long list of objectives and it's great if those are all smart and targeted with numbers and deadlines, but you wanna come up with five or less that are really your current priorities that you're gonna focus on. So that at the end of one to two years, you say we have made a difference here and here. And then the final point I wanna make is around um, what builds and sustains commitment. And so there's been a couple things that I've noticed across three very different institutions and countries. So first of all, um, there, one of the things that's been really powerful is a bottom-up cultural change. So this is especially with larger MPA staff, so where you have more people and where maybe the approach was a bit more hierarchical and there's an opportunity to move to a team approach. So where the staff really get excited about this and, it, and there's a big team building effort, um, it seems like the, the approach becomes really embedded in the staff culture and that's a very, very positive thing. Um, in, some, um, in some cases, uh, there are MPAs where the staff had higher skills uh, to begin with. So, you know, more staff had master's levels compared to other MPAs where maybe they, they had uh, high school or secondary school level. And uh, we did find that if you have a, a higher starting level of skill, that they move um, into this adaptive management approach and framework much quicker and have higher achievement within it. And so continuing to really build the skill level of MPAs is, is a very, very high priority and to invest in those staff. Um, but at the same time, we also found that some things that sort of impeded success across these three systems. And so, um, you know, one was when staff really had a low sense of empowerment and didn't feel that their basic needs were being met. It sort of is, is like looking at this pyramid of, of needs. And so if you're at the very base of the pyramid, you're worried about physiological needs and comfort and safety. And then you sort of move into belonging and, and esteem before you get to the final peak, which is really where you have purpose and potential. And that's what we're asking each staff and the institutions to do is to really look at the, the potential for change in these MPAs that each individual and that the group can achieve. And it is, it is thought that performance actually increases as, as people sort of move through this, this pyramid from focusing on wellness to actually having well-being. Um, but in some of the MPAs, because uh, there wasn't really a strong uh, sense of belonging and trust and, and there was lack of sort of social networks and there were some of the, the equipment and safety features weren't there, they really weren't ready to focus on an adaptive management process. And finally, uh, financial uh, issues uh, can be big. So there are some MPAs that really had uh, so few funds that, that they couldn't do the monitoring and enforcement and management actions that would be required to really achieve management effectiveness. So that is a really, really big barrier to achieving uh, successful MPAs. Um, and across all of this, one thing that seemed to be really important was having a catalyst. So having somebody either within the MPA or from outside the MPA who was really supporting the marine protected areas through a process of change. So, you know, what this looks like kind of reorganized is that the catalyst is really important in, you know, providing and co-creating tools and helping to build skills um, of the MPA staff. And they support this bottom-up cultural change process and they support the leadership in, in maintaining and enacting these changes. But there are some things that really do need to be present before these MPAs will be ready uh, for this to work. And so staff basic needs have to be met and operational finances really must be there. 
So as we think about increasing MPAs around the world, it's really, really important we think about what it's going to take to get these marine protected areas to effectiveness. And I'm hoping that the experience that I've shared from three countries in the Western Indian Ocean and the MPA staff has been helpful. And I'd like to really thank uh, funders and partners, and in particular, the MPA agencies, leaders, and staff who have um, made this such a fruitful and uh, great learning process. Thank you.